good morning all we have today with us our instructor troy stiger and he is going to speak about the few investigations related to the homicide and uh, he is especially going to discuss about that murder of patrick fleming i welcome you all on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science and clue for evidence foundation i welcome clyde also and thank you for uh, our accepting our offer thank you for accepting our offer for uh, giving a lecture on uh, such a very important case and we all want to witness we all have read about that case and we all want to witness that how you have done that investigation what all the difficulties you have faced and what all parameter you have followed so cloyd is a istigo uh, cloyd istigo is a chief criminal investigator washington state at on his own homicide investigation traffic system called at hits i welcome you all again on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science and clue for evidence foundation i request my co-host kritika mishra to give a brief introduction about our today's instructor cloyd istigo kritika over to you thank you so much sir and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our instructor today he is a chief criminal investigator washington state attorney general homicide investigation tracking system hits hits which supports homicide investigation in washington oregon and montana where we track every homicide in our database trying to link similar murders against jurisdictional lines they have a separate database for violent sexual assault and still another for various non homicidal violent crimes hits assist agencies particularly small agencies with current and cold cases homicides and review equivocal de equivocal deaths at the request of those agencies he supervises all investigators and analysts assigned assigned to hit state wide he retired from the seattle police department where he had worked since 1979 in march of 2016 he was a detective for 26 years with spd a homicide detective from 1994 until 2016 in that capacity he investigated and assisted with the investigation of 100 of homicides equivocal deaths and officer involved shooting including serial murders mass murder and acts of domestic terrorism resulting in deaths founding board members of the washington homicide investigator association director of investigation consulting for the american investigator society of cold cases ais a national group that assists agencies nationally and internationally in the investigation of cold case homicides this group contains expert at various aspects of homicides investigation such as investigative laboratory behavioral etc who consults on those cases and is recognized nationally as a premier investigative group director of investigation for the midwest cold case track force which assists with the cold case murder investigations in the midwest united states regular contributor to the crime stories with nancy grace seen on the fox nation streaming service with series xm radio instructor of various aspects of homicides and death investigations including interview and interrogation for new detective as well as in service trainer for experienced detective investigation of child death for police and social media personnel crime scenes awareness for fire department and ems personnel member of the atypical homicide study group which is run from northeastern university and is also comprised of many experts in the field he is a founding member of the washington cold case working group which is overseen by the office of the attorney general and includes agencies from around the state including police medical examiner coroner and laboratory personnel author of two books homicide the view from inside the yellow tape a crime memo a crime memo amazon publishing 2018 and seattle forgotten serial killer gray game grant acadia acadia publishing history press 2020 He was a he was a columnist at Forensic Magazine, expert witness retained by attorneys defending police agencies and personnel in Washington State dealing with homicides and death investigations, 
as well as as officer involving shooting he have been featured in the following books smoke mirrors and murder and rule 2008 footsteps in the snow charles lackman 2014 rock justice fiction william neil 2012 and this is not enough and on television program 48 years like cbs 2012 cold as ice death of death of night investigation discovery network episode miss fortune teller footsteps are in the snow nancy clay nancy glass productions lifetime movie network 2014 killer instinct with chris hansen episode senseless in seattle investigation discovery network itn production september 2015 real detective investigation Dis- discovery network episode Vengeance Bomb Production, February 2016, America Detective, Investigation, Discovery, Jupiter Entertainment, coming fall of 2020. I thank you so much for you for accepting our offer and and our request and let the let the audience in let the audience embrace with your knowledge. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Kathika, for the introduction. And uh, we have a participation, three thousand plus registration, uh, registered participation. We have from thirty-seven country and one seventy-eight organizations, and many are watching through the YouTube live and the Facebook updates also. So, with this, I uh, m- m- like to uh, request Claude to take over the session and start the presentation. Thank you, uh, Claude, for accepting our uh, invitation. Over Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Let me share my screen here. I need to uh, apologize at first because my presentation, I had a PowerPoint presentation all set up for this, but it will not open. So I, I don't know why, but I have another PowerPoint presentation that has some slides on this. I'm gonna be flipping back and forth between that PowerPoint and the case file that I have also to talk about this case. So hopefully I don't skip over things because I don't have it written in front of me. But <clears throat> so this case, uh, this murder, happened in December of 2011. I was, we were called to this building, which is the uh, Four Freedoms House. It's up at near 135th and Linden Avenue North in North Seattle. And it is a, an assisted living facility for elderly people, not a nursing home. They have their own apartments, but it, it provides extra service. There's a central cafeteria and things, but they all live in this place. They come and go. And uh, on the night of uh, December 11th of that year, Uh, one of the residents named Patrick Fleming. Uh, he was actually Francis Patrick Fleming. He was a, uh, a Navy veteran, a uh, Vietnam War veteran, won two, pur- two Purple Hearts and a Bronze Cross in Vietnam. And he was living on the seventh floor of this building. And he had uh, been out that evening with another a female friend of his that lived in this on the seventh floor of this building too in a different apartment. And they'd been out all day. And then they came back to his apartment in the early evening and watch the news on TV. And at about 7 p.m., she remembered that she had to go take her medicine. So she went to her apartment, which is, again, on the seventh floor, same floor, but on the opposite side of the building, so quite a ways away. So she walked down to back to her apartment about 7 p.m. About 7.20 or 7.30, she realized that she'd forgotten something at Patrick's apartment. So she called him on the phone. He didn't answer the phone, which was really unusual. <laughs> she went ahead and went about some business. And then about at 8.30, she walked back over to Patrick's apartment. And, and when she got there, she found the door ajar, which she thought was really unusual because it was very security conscious. And she, uh, she knocked on the door and said, Patrick, and opened the door. And that's what she saw from the door is the body of Patrick Fleming laying on the floor of the apartment. Now, she, uh, of course, was very upset, and she ran to a neighbor and pounded on the door, wanted somebody to call the police, but nobody would come out of their apartments, so she went all the way back to her apartment, and she called the police. Uh, Patrol officers came, and other people came, and then they eventually, I was at home, they called me and and other detectives, and we went to the scene, and my partner and I were the primary detectives in this case. So, again, we've got a guy in this apartment, uh, not a high, high, uh, likelihood of being a murder victim by his lifestyle or anything like that. He just is a senior guy living in these, he was 71, I think, living in these apartments and uh, nobody knew really why. So the night that this happened, uh, it was, we, of course, we're starting to talk to a lot of the other residents of the apartments and they tell us that, you know, Patrick 
he did he kept himself pretty well, but he had one thing about him is he collected rare coins and uncut U.S. currency, and he would tell anybody about it and show them about it. And he was really proud of that collection. I mean, he he had it was probably worth about sixty thousand dollars U.S., which was a lot of money to him, as you know, more than he made in a year. So, um, but he would show it to people all the time, and people said, "Man, you shouldn't talk about that. You shouldn't show that stuff." But he did. Well, this building is not in a bad neighborhood, but it's only a few blocks from a, a street in Seattle called Aurora Avenue North. And Aurora Avenue North used to be uh, US 99, a highway that went from Canada to Mexico down the West Coast and before the interstate system was built. And of course, then there were a lot of, in, in this area, there were a lot of little motels and stuff that were built when it was a roadside inn in the 40s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. These little motels were not for people, travelers to stop in. Well, when the freeway system came in, those motels became seedy little motels. And there's a lot of drug users and prostitution and stuff that goes on over there. And they'd been having a problem here at the Four Freedoms with people coming over from Aurora Avenue. It's only about four blocks away and stealing from the residents of this place or scamming them and things. So right away, that was the first thing we thought <clears throat> that um, somebody from Aurora Avenue came over and, and saw this guy. So we uh, we didn't, uh, I, don't, I think I'm gonna have to switch to, yeah, that's that's a close up shot of, I'll go here, let's go back, I'm sorry. Again, I'm really sorry about this, about this. Uh, that's not even the same case. I'm really sorry about the herky jerky way this is working because I had a complete PowerPoint made just about this case. So we're back to here. And it's not working. But anyway, so let me go down. That's the view. That's a closer view of Patrick. He's obviously brutally been murdered. There's a lot of blood. You can't, in this picture, you can't really see, but right in the corner up there, if you can see my cursor, there is a boot print in blood. Okay. That was one of the things that attracted our attention. So Patrick was a, uh, he was obsessive compulsive. I mean, he was that neat. Everything was in order. He, uh, if you looked in his closet, and you opened it, he had all his shirts hung up. They're all in laundry bags by shade of color going across. He had like 10 pairs of immaculately shined uh, shoes. So obviously something's going on there. Somebody went through his apartment and, uh, and was rifling, looking for something, right? So one of the things we noticed right away, over here on this chair, there's a chair against the wall. And you see there's blood on the back of that chair, right? So that tells us that this chair probably wasn't there when this happened. It was out here somewhere, and it got moved there, probably by the killer or one of the killers. So that we right away we zoomed in on that. His his uh, coin collection, by the way, was not there. It was missing. So we were pretty sure that was the motive stealing his coin collection. And that's a close up of the chair. You can see blood here and there on the. Handle. Of course, you know, usually when you get to a scene like this and there's blood like that, it's going to be your victim's blood, right? So you don't get too excited. But we didn't know for sure. Okay. The next thing that, this is the hallway. It's a hallway that leads, and I had a, a, a floor diagram of the apartment as part of my other PowerPoint. But there, the, there's a doorway and then a hall. To the left, halfway down the hall is the bathroom, and then straight ahead is that bed. The view you had of Patrick laying on the floor was from the doorway. Well, there were blood drops leading to the doorway. Okay, and that's a little unusual because you don't usually, even with a weapon, you know, it's not going to drip that much that far away from the body, but they, we had blood on the floor, so that piqued our attention. I had my crime scene people collect all this stuff. Okay, now I'm getting ahead of myself. So now... Excuse my my uh, flipping around, but I'm going back. I'm going to the case file here, and those are. I really, really apologize for this awkward presentation with going back and forth. This is uh, another angle inside the apartment. Uh, the chair would be over here next to the TV. There's a little stove microwave set up, and this is the hallway I'm talking about, and the blood is on the floor down here. Patrick's body, you can see his feet sticking out at the bottom of the screen there. His, that's where he was. So 
uh, right away, again, we're, we're talking about the, uh, we're thinking the people from out on Aurora Avenue might have come and done this. This is another view, and you can see kind of up in the corner there is that boot print I'm talking about in blood. Okay, he's not wearing any shoes. He's barefoot, so that's going to be the killer's boot print. We're pretty sure about that. We, we double-checked with because uh, the fire department had originally become the paramedics, and we check, checked with patrol officers and, and said, who, who went into that room? And they said, nobody went past the bathroom. That's as close as anybody went in. Because once it was obvious he was dead, they backed out. So that was good. So that told me that because you know, I thought maybe that's a firefighter's boot, right? But it wasn't. So let me go back. So we uh, we uh, got information. One woman told us that she just moved into the building and she was in the basement of the building at about seven o'clock. And there was an unusual. You have a, you have something, sir? Oh. Yeah. There was. A, oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm saying that your PowerPoint is not moving. So can you- Yeah, I know the PowerPoint isn't yet because I'm switching. I'm not going to PowerPoint. I'm, I'm going to the files because I'm getting, I'll, I'll go back to the PowerPoint, but I'm, I don't have it. This, the stuff I have before that isn't, uh, fine, fine. isn't going to work out. That's, that's the kind of the, uh, the awkwardness of not having the PowerPoint working out for this case specifically. No so anyway, let me tell you, so basically a woman said that they were in the uh, basement of the building where the laundry room is at about seven o'clock and saw a young man in the basement and he didn't belong there. And, you know, she said, well, he, uh, that's, she said, I saw this guy, I came across this guy about seven o'clock at night. Well, that's just before the murder, right? And he's in the building. So right away I thought, well, this might be our guy. So we had her get with a composite artist and this is the sketch she gave of the, uh, of the person that she thought that she saw in the basement at about seven o'clock, a little bit before the murder. So we put a bulletin out and sent it to everybody out and about. And uh, one of the things that came up later, so when we're interviewing all the people, a name came up. The people kept saying, one woman said, you need to talk to Sylvia. Sylvia is, uh, Sylvia Sutton was her name. We didn't know at the time. Sylvia, she used to live there but she was always borrowing money from Patrick and things like that. She was all, it was always weird because she would be with Patrick and borrow money. And I said, well, what's Sylvia like? Well, she's like an 83 year old woman, you know, and immediately I think in this, well, this guy was not killed by an 83 year old woman because there was a lot of forest done there. Right. So that I said, yeah, okay, thanks. You know, it's, it's an 83 year old woman, but later on. So I, I, I'd say that because it'll come up important. It'll be important later. <clears throat> We put this bulletin out, and uh, and for for uh, this guy might be involved in this murder. Well, a couple of days later, we're up in that area, going back to the building, and we hear over the police radio that somebody has stopped somebody nearby who matches that sketch. So we drive over there, my partner and I drive over there and see this guy. And there's a guy sitting on a curb, and he kind of looks like he could match the sketch, you know. And he, he so, I mean, he's he's close enough. So I walk over to him and I say, "Hey, what, where's your? You got ID?" And he says, "Well, it's on my on my uh, the car, my wallet's on the I heard of the patrol car." So I go over there and I open his wallet, and there's a credit card in his wallet and a woman's name. And I take this ID out and I go, "Who's this credit card belong to?" And he says, "Well," uh, he goes, "Oh, I just found that it's not active." Well, you know, how does he know it's not active if he didn't try to use it? So I, that's my probable cause to arrest him. I say, "Yeah, yeah, you're coming with me. We're going downtown because you tried to use this." credit card, not because I give me a little more time to talk to him. So we go downtown <clears throat> and I start asking him about what's going on and tell him about a murder that happened at the Four Freedoms House. And he actually was shocked. He doesn't know anything about that. And so I'm talking to him about it and say, and, and then I tell him uh, about this guy getting killed. And I show him a picture of Patrick Fleming when he was alive. And he looks at it and he goes, Oh, I know that guy. He goes, I said, you do. And he goes, yeah, he, 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 he told me I needed to join the military and get my life straightened out. You know, he'd buy me coffee all the time. And then he started crying about the guy. So now I'm thinking, this isn't the guy that killed him. But I told him I was going to make him my informant. He's going to go out in the street and find out what he could find on the street. And so he did. <clears throat> and he called me a couple of times and he said, nobody knows anything about this out here, which is really unusual in a case like this. You know, somebody should know something about that. So that kind of set me off on the Aurora Avenue thing. I didn't 
necessarily think at that point uh, that had anything to do with it. But then I got a call again from another resident at the apartment, at the building. And he told me that the night of the murder, these three heavy set women with dressed really garishly were sitting in the seventh floor elevator lobby on couches and they just sat there and didn't look at anybody and they were really out of place. He says, they looked like they were trying to be fancy, but they were just so garish. He says, a couple other residents saw them too. And uh, he said, I don't know what the wheel, but they're, they're just these weird women. They just sat there. And so we talked to a couple other, uh, uh, excuse me, a couple other uh, residents that said the same thing. So then uh, uh, we're talking to a, a different resident and he says, and he brings up uh, Sylvia's name again, and it's a completely different person. And you know, he says, "Yeah, she had a niece that she and she would talk to Patrick all the time." And well, you know, basically the thing when two people unrelated to each other start telling you the same name, you probably should look at it, right? So that's what that's what we did. And we went down and found out from the manager because she used to live there; she didn't anymore. Who she was, and what was going on with her. So we. Uh, she gave us Sylvia's name and all this information about her. We went back to our office and we started running Sylvia's name in the computer system. And we found out that she was actively a victim of a, uh, of a, a senior scam, like a financial scam that was being investigated by our police department uh, in a different detective unit downstairs. So we went down to the detective unit downstairs and talked to the detective, Pam St. John, and say, what's the deal with, with uh, Sylvia, Hunt, uh, Sylvia Sutton? You're investigating her. She's a victim of a scam. And she told us this story that Sylvia had lost uh, her, uh, her life partner. And she was, Sylvia was a retired teacher, but she'd done really well for herself financially for, through investments. And she'd lost her life uh, partner and was at a street fair in Seattle. And when she was at the street fair, she went into a, a tent for palm reading. And when she did the palm reading, she, um, the lady told her that she had a very dark aura and things were really bad for her, but she could fix it and she could help. And she had this guy named Father Thomas who can help you clean your aura and make your spirit better. But it would cost money is the first thing she said. So Sylvia um, starts giving this lady money a little bit at first but more and more. And, pretty, and then she starts going to see this lady who, who she knew as Lady Monica. And every time she'd see Lady Monica, Lady Monica would say, here, take this and give her a pill. It'll relax you. And so she'd take these pills. And Sylvia started giving Lady Monica money and it got bigger and bigger. And by the time it was all over, actually she spent so much money, she had to move out of where she was living. And that's why she ended up at Four Freedoms House because Lady Monica had moved her in there. And, and then uh, suddenly, in the middle of the night, Lady Monica moved her out, along with some other people she was with. And she had given, she, she owned 30,000 shares of Microsoft and sold them and gave all the money to Lady Monica. In the end, she gave Lady Monica about $1.5 million and then was left broke. And then one day she was just, you know, by herself and she realized what had happened and the reason she realized that she'd been being drugged by this woman. So she was always in the daze. And when it was wearing off, she realized she'd been scammed and reported it. So that was really interesting. And, and so we wanted to talk to Sylvia and we, we got a hold of her and said, uh, if you, when you, because uh, this Pam had not been able to figure out who Lady Monica was. She showed her a bunch of pictures and had never been able to figure it out. So she finally said that we, we talked to her and said, well, how do you get a hold of her if you need her? She goes, well, I have a phone number. Oh, okay, so she gives us a phone number. We run the phone number, and it comes back that it's uh, to a woman named, well, it comes back to a man's name, but a woman's been associated with it named Brendan Nicholas. So we run, we check Brendan Nicholas and find out that she's, uh, she's Roma, which is a gypsy, basically. And Roma is the culture. And so, and she is currently on probation for some other scams that she was pulling. And so we, we, you know, we, do a, we do another search of her in a different database we have of all the police agents. And, and we find out that she was being investigated at that point by a small suburban agency near Seattle and that they'd done a search warrant on her house. And when they did the search warrant, they listed all the things they 
collected. And one thing they listed that they collected was a brown uh, briefcase. And in the briefcase, there were papers with the name Francis Patrick Flem Fleming on them. So that's our aha moment. I mean, she's got the papers of a murder victim with her. She's involved in our murder. So right away, we start really pulling in all the things to work on her. Because I knew she was gypsy, I had a, a friend who was retired who, when he was working, he just, he just worked gypsy cases. And so I called him up and I said, hey, we got a case that might involve some gypsies. And he goes, and I named Brendan. He knows. Oh, I know Brendan Nicholas. Yeah, yeah, she do that kind of thing. And so he tells me, I got a couple of old informants that I can give to you. They'll tell you all you need to know. So he, he set me up with a couple of gypsy informants, which was invaluable. And they were very good. And they explained to me that Roma is the culture and gypsy is the criminal element of the Roma culture. That's how they explained it to me. And they knew Brenda and everybody around her. So I'll get back to them in a minute. Again, I'm sorry this is so disjointed because my PowerPoint didn't work and it was all very professionally laid out at first. But anyway, so um, she, we find out that Brenda has an appointment with a uh, probation officer and like the next day or two days later. So he tells us that she's supposed to be there like Thursday at 8.30 a.m. So we're down there in the parking lot, all in unmarked, not unmarked, but undercover cars. And we watch and we see her pull in and she's been, uh, she has, uh, a, there's a guy driving the car, obviously a gypsy man. She gets out and goes in, is in there for about 20 minutes and then comes out, gets back in the car and leaves. And we start following them and we follow them all over and they take us, let me get a different picture here because they, uh, they lead us to the north end of the city. And when they're in the north end of the city, they they pull into a, uh, they pull it, excuse me, they pull into a, uh, a shop that it was on. And that's, that's the shop, it's a, you see the palm reading place in the north end of Seattle. So what we do is uh, we figure out that they're actually, this is a business, but they're actually living in this business also. So we set up uh, what are called pole cameras and pole cameras are basically, uh, we have undercover detectives come out and they're like dressed like city workers with a cherry picker truck and they go up to a utility pole and they put a box on it and the box has a camera. And then they went to the other side and put another one on the other side and we can access that over the internet from anywhere and we can zoom in, pan left, pan right, zoom really close, zoom back, take still photos, like this is a still photo we took, or videos as we need them. And that's what we did, and we were watching them. In the meantime, we got a call from, I got a call back from the crime lab because we submitted all that evidence. And they tell me that the blood, the, the blood on the chair, that folding chair, the blood drops going out the door and also swabbings that were taken from Francis, uh, Patrick Fleming's fingertips all have a, a male DNA source that is not Patrick Fleming. At that point, he's, he's named individual A. He's not Patrick Fleming and he left a, a male left blood there. So right now we got to, we have the blood and they ran them in CODIS, which is the, the federal uh, DNA database in the US and he was not in it. So he's somebody who has never been convicted of a felony or else didn't have his, his DNA processed for whatever reason, an unknown suspect. So we have the killer's DNA, at least one of the killer's DNA, but we don't know who he is. So we, I told you about when we, we were watching the, uh, the car come up at the, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, probation officer's office. And the guy that was driving that, <laughs> was this guy we later determined, this guy right here, his name's Archie Marks. He is, and we find out from both uh, my, the informants that I have and other people that he is Brenda's husband, gypsy husband. I don't know if they're legally married, but he's their gypsy husband. And we think he's probably the source of the DNA. Well, we watched him and every day he would come out of that shop and he would smoke a cigarette and toss the cigarette butts down. So, one day we went there and we had another undercover officer dressed like a city worker 
sweep up all the all of the cigarette butts that were in that area. Cleaned them all up. Went away. We watched while Archie came out, smoked another cigarette, dropped it down. And when he went back in, the detective came back out, collected that cigarette butt because he knew it was the only one because he'd cleaned up all the others. And he brought it to me and I submitted it to the crime lab. You know, in a perfect world, that would have been a perfect thing to do. But I got it back. I got the report back a couple days that said, he's not the guy. So we're back at square one. He's not the guy. How can that possibly be? He's not the guy, right? I mean, he's her husband and all this stuff. So we're back to square one and we start looking and we, we keep taking pictures of all these people and I show them to these informants and they can name this guy as him and that's Archie. But there's one person, he goes, I don't know this woman. She's not Roma. I don't know who she is. And there's also a guy. I don't know he, who he is. He's not Roma either. So we start looking at those people and we decide we're going to bring them in based on the scam that was being investigated in uh, where uh, Sylvia was being scammed. So we make sure we have them arrested and brought in and we put them in there and we put them all in, in individual rooms and have the Pam St. John, the original detective talk to um, each of them. Well, she talks, tries to talk to Brenda. Brenda says, I want a lawyer right away. So she can't talk to her books her in jail. The other one is a girl named Gilda Ramirez. She talks to her and she does pretend she doesn't know anything. Then she talks to this guy, the guy who ended up being a guy named Archie Youngblues. I'm excuse me, not Archie. Uh, Charles Youngblues, who Charles Youngblues is a is a white guy. He's not a gypsy. He has no criminal history, but he kind of hangs around Brenda and drives her everywhere she goes. So Pam starts interviewing him. And my partner and I are on the other side, of, just like you know, on the other side of the one-way glass watching it. And I look at my partner and go, this guy's too much of a wimp. He didn't do it. But he might know something about who did it, right? So we decide we're going to start talking to him after she leaves. And I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. After she leaves, we, uh, we're going to start talking to him. Hopefully this works and you hear the sound and everything. Can you guys hear that? Yes, it is. Remind you, at this point, I'm pretty sure uh, Charles is a witness. And that's how it affects the way I talk to him. Because I talk to witnesses different than I talk to suspects. But you'll see. I've, I've, so this is our initial interview with him.
Okay, so in this interrogation, which again, I didn't think he was the guy, I was pressuring him to give us what he knew. And he admitted that um, Brenda was selling some coins and he identified specific coins. Matter of fact, let me go back. Specific types of coins that uh, Charles, I mean, that Brenda was trying to sell. And he identified this is the type of things that she had here. He had, and he marked, yeah, I saw some like that, and I saw some other stuff. So we were using him as a witness. But you saw at the end, because this is what I always do, I swabbed his cheek. Mind if I take a little, you mind if I swab your cheek? I just want to take, oh, yeah, no problem. I swabbed his cheek. So I got the, uh, I sent the, uh, the uh, swabs off. And let me go back here. Again, I'm really sorry. This is so disjointed. First of all, let me go. <laughs> let me. This is this is the first lab about um, the cigarette butts from Archie. It says. Uh, This is the one that says the DNA typing of individual B, which is Archie, his cigarette butts, is excluded as being the source or possible contributor to the DNA typing profiles previously obtained from the cloth on the chair, et cetera, et cetera. That's the one we got from Archie. And so, oops. And I got this one back from, from uh, for Charles Youngbluth. We'll get down to the meat of this. This here that says that it's good. The DNA from the cloth on the chair and the major component is consistent to a single source male and matches the reference DNA type of profile of Charles Youngbluth. The esti estimated probability of selecting an un unrelated individual at random in the US population with a matching profile is one in 10 quintillion. That's a big number. Matter of fact, I mentioned that to Charles later. Uh, and then again, the blood that was found, uh, the, other, the other blood was also Charles's. So Charles, that guy I thought was too much of a wimp to do this, was a killer in this case. All right, and then so let me go back to my PowerPoint. We went, I went and got Charles, this this first one you see on June 27th, and it, it took till October 16th to get the other one back. So I'll play. This is the interview of him when we uh, brought when I brought him back in. Again, I want you to notice the tone of my inter interview with him. Is much quieter and softer because now I know he's our suspect. I never get in the face of a suspect. I get in the face of witnesses sometimes who I, I think are going to lie to me. But because now he's my suspect, we're not doing that. We're, we're just playing it really soft. But this is how that goes. Right. I do this videos have the audio also because audio is not audible in the video. Oh, it's not. You can't. Did you hear it before? Or uh, we can only see the video. No audio is coming. No audio is coming. Oh, of course. All right. So, <laughs> this is gonna really get this off. All right. So what he? I don't know why it's not playing. So the uh, what he basically says. Yeah, I have to basically pull his teeth to get him to say it. He said that uh, he would take. Uh, Sylvia and Brenda to the Four Freedoms house and would would drop them off and then they would get in the car and he would go, take them somewhere else and they would be talking and one of the things he says is that Sylvia told I mean excuse me Brenda told Sylvia I really want you to get close to Patrick because you know you, you should really get to know him and and that uh, Brenda had Sylvia introduce herself to Patrick as her, as her aunt, or her niece, I'm sorry, give her, Sylvia's niece. So she, uh, she, uh, he brought him back and forth all the time. And then at one point, Sylvia said to Charles, excuse me, I keep getting Sylvia, 
Brenda said to Charles, this guy has some coins. I need to get them. And he said, okay, yeah, we're going to go there and we're going to kill him and we're going to take them. And then Charles said, well, I said, and I asked Charles, what did you think? She, what did you think when she told you that? He said, oh, I thought she was just kidding. Did she, did she tell you again? He goes, yeah. And then did you ever question why? Well, no. And then finally he said they had meetings, him, and he would bring in this other girl, Gilda Ramirez, who would come in, who was the woman that, the other woman that uh, my informants didn't know who she was, said she's not Roma, but she lived there at the house and had her in these meetings. We're going to go kill this guy and take his coins. Okay. And then she had her 15-year-old son, who was also obviously a gypsy. He was in the meetings. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go kill him and get his coins. She didn't take her 15-year-old son, but she, he was in on all the meetings. So finally, one day, she came to Charles and said, and Gilda, and said, we're going to do it tonight. So she and Charles went to a Goodwill, and they bought all these clothes and bought some knives. And, and they dressed in these clothes. Now, Charles wouldn't admit that he was dressed as a woman, but the witnesses all said there were three women there. So I'm sure he was dressed as a woman. He just wouldn't admit it. He, they got together and um, went to the, that night they got dressed, drove to the Four Freedoms just after dark, went inside and they said they waited, he, he acknowledged they waited in the, in the elevator lobby because there were a lot of people around until everybody was gone. And then they went down and the plan was that Gilda would knock on the door and say something like, I, uh, I, I just moved in. I need, can I use your phone to order cable to get him to let her in? And so they got there and knocked on the door and he opened it and she, and she tried that line. He says, no, you're not coming in. And then uh, Brenda came along and forced him in. They all had him in the room. And he said, Brenda started trying to stab him in the stomach. And he had a lot of, uh, Charles, excuse me, uh, Patrick had a lot of superficial chest and stomach wounds on him with the autopsy. And, and so that was consistent, like she was trying, but she didn't know how to do it and was push, not pushing hard enough. And then she, he said that, that Patrick started choking Brenda. So she yelled for him and they, she and Brenda, he and Brenda took, her to, took him to the ground. And I said, what, where was Gilda during all this? He goes, I don't know, she disappeared. And so they, he talked about them stabbing her, stabbing this guy. And he, and he said they were stabbing him in the throat. Well, I didn't show you the gruesome pictures, but his, he was almost decapitated. There were cuts on both sides of his throat that were devastating. And all, the only thing holding his head on was his spinal cord. And so, and I said, well, were you on the same side or different? No, we were on different sides. And so everything he was giving, giving these little, little things that you need to have that are corroboration to show that he was really there like when he talked about that apartment, they said, well, where was it? He goes, well, you go down a hallway to your left and it's about halfway down on the left. Well, that's how it really was. So to make sure somebody's not giving you a false confession, you look for these little, have them tell you these things. And when he starts talking about how stabbing on both sides of the chest or neck, I mean, uh, that was consistent with the wounds also. Now he told me that at one point, Brenda didn't think he was stabbing enough. So she stabbed him in the hand, stabbed Charles in the hand, which caused him to bleed which left his blood to scene and ultimately sealed, sealed both her and his fate. Okay. But they got the thing, he got him dead and they said they got all the coins and they started going through everything. And then they just left and went to a motel and he said he didn't get anything out of this. So in the, in the meantime, then I go get, have Gilda. We have to go find Gilda. We get her and drag her in. At first she says, you know, she's from Colombia. She has a strong Hispanic accent. And I started asking her about this and she said, no, no, I don't know anything about that. And then I showed her a few seconds of this interview here that you can't hear, but, and she uh, says, okay, I'll talk. And she tells the story. The, the interesting thing about her was that she said, her story was, she was an architect in New York and she just had a baby and her boyfriend left her and she was very sad. She was walking down the street one day in Queens when a woman walked up to her and said, I can tell you're sad. And she said, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm a palm reader. I'm a mind reader. I can help you with this. You have a dark aura. And this all sounds familiar, right? And so she goes, yeah. And she started giving her money. And it was Brenda who was in New York. 
and she started giving her money and giving her money until uh, she she got her she, her parents mortgaged her house. She gave her over a million dollars also. And then Brenda was gone, and she finally called her and says, "I have nothing. You left me. I have nothing, and I know I, I got fired from my job." And she said, "Brenda said, well, come to Seattle. We'll bring you out here, and I'll help you out here." So she flew to Seattle with her baby, and basically became an indentured slave to uh, Brenda. I don't know if Brenda was drugging her also, but she said she was doing everything for her. And 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 when Brenda said, "We're going to go kill this guy," she didn't think anything of it. They went to the apartment, but she said once they got there, she couldn't do it. She ran to the bathroom and hid, and but saw Charles and Brenda doing it. That's where she went. So that was consistent with Charles saying she disappeared. So she started to she we, we turned her basically. She just she became a witness for the state. And uh and she told us all the different stuff that was going on and helped us out. She said that uh a few nights later, a few a couple of weeks later, actually, that Archie took her and they had all the clothing they'd taken and the knives. And they went to a spot on what's called the Ship Canal in Seattle, which is a canal that connects Lake Washington, Lake Union with Puget Sound, which is saltwater. And they went down there and they burned the clothing in a barrel and then threw the knives in the water. And she took me to that spot. Let me see. This is, by the way, that is, uh, hang on. That's Gilda there. She said she's Colombian in her in her in her uh, culture. They believe in that stuff, and it, and it's strongly true. So he, she took us to the spot, and this is the spot in the ship canal that they said they threw the knives into the water at. So I had a police boat come down there with some divers, and I showed them where she showed us. Now she threw them, and they they came down there, and when they dropped the anchor. One, the anchor actually landed on one of the knives that made it stick up at a 45 degree angle. So they went down and we recovered those knives several months later. Those were the knives that they used to kill this, uh, kill the woman. This, the top one here, I don't think that was involved. This was the honing rod and the two knives. The other thing Gilda told me was that they stopped, that they were, went to another old man's house before this murder because they had another guy that had money, lived in a different part of town and they were gonna do that to him but when he knocked, they knocked on the door and she tried to force away and he said, I got a gun and they all took off running. And that's when they went over to, to uh, Patrick's house. The, uh, the, uh, that's, that's Gilda, I mean, that's uh, Brenda Nicholas. Like I said, she was the mastermind of this whole thing. She would talk uh, on the phone with Archie and they would talk about this murder. Of course, all the phone calls were recorded but she was speaking Roma, and Roma is not a written language. It's only a verbal language that's unique to the Roma culture and the gypsies. And, and she said in the, he said to her, don't talk about this, this is recorded. And she said, oh, this is Roma. No, they'll never find a translator. Well, we did. We found a guy who was a police officer in California who actually grew up in the Roma community and he, and he translated the calls for us. So that was very valuable. Again, guilt, so Gilda pled guilty to robbery and theft charges, and she was sentenced to eight and a half years. Charles, but he testified also for the state, although he only he actively involved, took part in the murder. So he got convicted or, or pled guilty to murder in first degree with a deadly weapon and sentenced to 25 years in prison. And Bre Brendan Nicholas was convicted on trial of murder one with a deadly weapon and sentenced to 35 years. And uh, that's basically all I have because I don't have my PowerPoint. <laughs> sorry about that. And I guess we'll open up the questions. I'm sorry, I'm a little short, I know, but I had the uh, PowerPoint uh, PowerPoint set for that and I don't have it anymore. So any questions or anything that we can do from here? So uh, I will request all the participants, uh, they can raise uh, their hand if they have any question they can type a question into the chat box also. We'll take uh, me, Brenda sir, and Kratika, we'll take the questions from uh, chat box. And uh, if anyone wants to ask directly, they can uh, raise a hand, we will unmute and uh, you can uh, uh, ask your question. Any participant? Uh, one question, Soria asked, uh, when do we identify people like Glenn, uh, 
Gilda as a witness and not as an accomplice for the murder? Well, she was arrested as a, an accomplice for the murder. But because she didn't actively participate in the murder, the prosecution did a deal with her to give her the lesser charge in exchange for her testimony against Brenda. Yeah. So the people who are watching through YouTube, they can also type their question into YouTube box. Ajay Puras, uh, uh, he wants to ask some questions. So you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to know in terms of, uh, did you find any kind of uh, psychological uh, behavioral anomaly while talking to people uh, when you raised questions about the suspected murder? Well, I didn't, we didn't really go that way. I mean, we, I guess, you know, that if you, the only psychological thing I got into was Gilda and the fact that she was a normal person with a regular job doing fine with no criminal history and went from there to voluntarily taking part in this murder it was kind of like the, and I don't know if you're familiar with Patty Hearst, the Patty Hearst syndrome in the U.S. from the 1970s when she was kidnapped by the Symbionese Liberation Army. And she was uh, the Hearst family, a very wealthy family in the U.S., but she took part in bank robberies and took a, it was kind of that kind of, almost a Stockholm syndrome situation. But we didn't do any kind of, uh, I didn't do any psychological evaluations on them. I'm sure once they were convicted, that was done by the Department of Corrections, but I didn't do anything on that. So the question that uh, uh, from the uh, one of the participants, what all difficulty you find in uh, during the investigation of this case? Oh, I, there were all kinds of difficulties. First of all, I had no idea. Like, well, this is where all murders like this are by like the whodunits. You have no idea who did it or what happened. You have your suppositions and your ideas that could be. But the, the difference is you have to be fluid. You can't, a bad detective decides what the answers are and then tries to find evidence to support his position. A good detective can have working theories, but they're not set in stone and they can be turned on, its, on a dime if the evidence points somewhere else. And that's what happened in this case, because we had our working theory, but it ended up being not at all true, but we had no problem just ignoring that. If you saw the follow-up report, half of it is it is it's this way in every whodunit case all these steps we took part and people we interviewed had nothing to do with this case but we thought they might so that happens it's normal and, and, and you have to do that but you cannot but you also have to be able to follow the evidence wherever it leads you and don't don't decide you know what it is okay any other participant they want to ask any question they can raise their hand or they can type a question into the chat box. I think uh, no one had the question and the session was so clear cut that uh, it is completely grasped by the participant. So with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Cloyd Stiga for taking out uh, time and giving this session and uh, uh, one question is that, uh, uh, can you please share the best way to know a hidden, hided murder from Somalia? Oh boy, I don't know much about Somalia and there's a problem there because I don't think, I, until recently they didn't have an organized government. So <laughs> that's, that is a problem. And, and unfortunately, I don't know enough about that to give you a good answer. Yeah. So with this, I would like to thank once again for uh, taking out the time and uh, asking, uh, like uh, giving that view on the different murders and how investigation is still work. With this, uh, uh, I would uh, request you, although we are in a virtual space, so I will request you to kindly accept our, uh, on behalf of Clue for Evidence Foundation and Sherry Law Institute of Forensic Science, kindly accept uh, a certificate of appreciation from our side for delivering such a wonderful lecture. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, request uh, uh, Mr. B and Sanindar also to uh, give the vote of thanks to the Cloyd for taking our time and uh, giving a session. Uh, find us up. And again, I want to apologize for that PowerPoint. It would have been a much smoother if I had the PowerPoint working correctly like I thought it was. But, so we stumbled through it. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think there is some technical error with the him. So okay. let's uh, move forward. 
So we exist because of our dedicated team. So I would like to thank my team, dedicated team, those who are racing to all of you. Uh, and these are my uh, team members, uh, those who are working and uh, giving, reaching to you all uh, on a, through the social media, through the WhatsApp and the other groups. I would uh, like to thank my dedicated team member. So early, earlier we were six, then we expanded to eight. Now we are expanded to 28. So I welcome all of you. I request all of you also to accept that uh, certificate of uh, appreciation from uh, Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science and the Proof for Evidence Foundation for your dedication towards the forensic science and working with us. So uh, I, I would request uh, Afreen uh, to accept that certificate of appreciation from our side. Saza Azin, Pratika Mishra, Vaishnavi, Dr. Janita Jasuja, Tanya, Pooja Chakravarti, Lakshya Kalra, Kailas Negi, Sudhakar, Nitika, Saddam, Mivel, Kanheri, Lakshika, Amala, Ruchika, uh, Jaslin, Anmol, Palak, Neha, Nimisha, Pallavi, Priya, Raj, Shivani, Tahir, and Dr. Pragnes. So thank you all uh, for joining the session today through the, this Zoom room and through the YouTube uh, live. You all the participants can download your certificate uh, through the website forensicevents.com slash download certificates. There is a column of the download certificate uh, with the pink color. You just have to put your email ID and you can download your certificate from there. From mobile, if you are downloading, you have to scroll down and by scrolling down, you can come uh, and you will find that download button down uh, on the lower of, on the lower portion of the page. So, with this, uh, uh, this is the view where you will find that uh, this is a download certificate. You have to enter your email ID here. Then your certificate will be uh, present like here with your email ID. You have to click on the download certificate. You will find the certificate signed by uh, Floyd and. Uh, I once again thank you all the participants uh, for joining uh, on this Saturday morning. I would like to thank Cloyd also for uh, taking out time. And uh, uh, there are some technical difficulty, and uh, but yes, we manage the things uh, in a timely manner. <laughs> so, with this, uh, we would like to welcome you all in the uh, uh, this uh, next session also. And uh, we are going to organize this uh, international symposium in uh, September 2021. So you all are welcome in this uh, international sim uh, symposium also by ProHR. And with this, I would uh, uh, request uh, Cloyd to give the closing remark. Well, I just, again, I just, uh, if, you know, if you're looking, I know you're from the forensic side and there was a lot of forensic stuff in here, probably more I could have talked about if I had my PowerPoint. But uh, it's just the importance of uh, scene integrity. Again, detectives following the leads wherever they take you without any preconceived notions. And I'm more than uh, happy to have shared this with you. The, the, this, this case has actually been on two different episodes of Investigation Discovery. The, the uh, Chris Hansen killer one was about this case. Also, the, the uh, one that you mentioned on the other show uh, called uh, Misfortune Teller was also on this case and I'm actually filming another one next week with a different investigation discovery show about this case. It's got a lot of people, everybody wants to hear about it. You know, I have a lot of good cases. I worked a couple hundred murders in my time, but but I, I'm glad to share it with you. I'm sorry again that my technical difficulties, but we stumbled through it and thank you for everybody who said thank you on this on the uh, chats. I've seen them all and I appreciate you having the interest in uh, this work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claude. See you all on the next Sunday with some another speaker in this international lecture.